New Year's Eve is typically a joyous occasion. It's a sign of change, that the old is fading away for new. It's a time to celebrate a promising fresh start, generally along with your family and closest friends. In Japan, this day is known as Omisoka, and it is widely regarded as one of the most important days of the year. There are numerous customs and traditions involved, which most people in Japan follow. While in America, New Year's Eve is often seen as a time to party and kiss someone at midnight. In Japan, New Year's is treated among the most prestigious of holidays. But at the turn of this past century, an event occurred that forever marred the holiday season. It occurred in the district of Tokyo, and for close to two decades, what happened on this night has continued to completely stump investigators. This is the story of the Setagaya murders. In Japan, the culture celebrates the end of a century differently than most. In America, we welcomed the dawn of a new millennium with the infamous Y2K scare. And in Japan, they were celebrating the beginning of the new century an entire year later, with the opening of 2001. Here, in the Setagaya district of Tokyo, lived a family known as the Miyazawas. The Miyazawa family were, by most standards, your typical Japanese family. Mikio Miyazawa, the 44-year-old patriarch of the family, worked for Interbrand, a London-based marketing firm. It's unclear what kind of work Mikio did for the business, but this was a large company with offices in over 20 countries, who had worked on large marketing campaigns for companies like Microsoft, Nissan, Xerox, and many others. The year before, 1999, Interbrand had actually been the company responsible for branding the term Wi-Fi. Fellow employees at Interbrand described Mikio as congenial. They claimed that he was, quote, the kind of guy that got on well with everyone, definitely not the sort of person to make enemies, unquote. Yasuko Miyazawa, the family's 41-year-old mother and wife, was very much the same, seen as kind and compassionate by everyone. She was a teacher that spent a lot of time with the couple's two children, 8-year-old Nina and 6-year-old Ray. Nina, the daughter, was in the second grade, and was by all accounts a very typical little girl. She was playful, she was fun, and she enjoyed soccer and ballet, both of which she was very active in. Ray, the youngest member of the family, had been going through an issue lately. The six-year-old had a speech impediment, which had been causing the family a fair amount of stress. They had started to seek out professional help for the matter, but it was still a real worry to them as they prepared to bring in the new year. Roughly 10 years prior, Mikio and Yasuko Miyazawa had moved into their Setagaya-based home. At the time, 1990, it had been a burgeoning development with over 200 families, and it seemed like a nice enough area to start and raise a family. Setagaya was just one of Tokyo's 23 districts, and it was actually the second largest of all of them, located just southwest of the main city. Just a short distance away from the Tokyo Bay, Setagaya is a very residential-looking area that stands out from its busy and cramped surroundings. The Miyazawa family home was an interesting thing in and of itself. The home was a shared building that was split into two, so on the outside it looked like one house, but was much closer to a duplex than anything. It allowed the Miyazawas to live right next door to Yasuko's family. Her mother mostly, but also her sister and brother-in-law, who lived with Yasuko's mother during this time period. In essence, this allowed a total of seven family members to live in this shared domicile, although there was no internal connection between the two houses. Just like other duplexes, to get from one side to the other, you needed to go outside and enter through another door. What would be the most interesting part of this house in the future, though, was the park that was right behind it. The park had been there for years, but as 2001 approached, the city had been planning on expanding it. This meant that most of the Miyazawa's neighbors had been moving out in recent months, as the city had been trying to buy their houses in order to make way for the expansion. 
The community that had once contained over 200 families had now been narrowed down to just four. The Miyazawas and their relatives living next door, as well as two other families that lived down the street. Besides that, it was a relative ghost town of a neighborhood. Most of the activity from the area was happening in the skate park, which was located right behind the Miyazawa family home. This was the busiest part of the ever-expanding park, but led to some issues for the Miyazawa clan. You see, the skate park was located directly behind their house, separated only by a fence. In the weeks leading up to New Year's Eve, Mikio had actually confronted a group of loud and obnoxious teenagers at the skate park for making too much noise. At around the same time, a witness from the neighborhood reported seeing Mikio confront a group of young rebels that belonged to the Bosozoku, a Japanese motorcycle gang. Due to the increasing foot traffic in the park behind them, which the city was planning on expanding even further in the new year, the Miyazawas were one of the last families to make plans to move. It was December of 2000, and in just a few months, they were going to be moving to another house in the area. So all they needed to do was rough out the skate park hooligans for a few more months, and then they wouldn't have to worry about it ever again. Unfortunately, they would never get the chance. The week before New Year's Eve would be known for some other unusual experiences for the Miyazawa family, besides the encounters with hooligans and punks that Mikio had to deal with. Months prior, back in the summer, the community had started to notice many of the area's animals being physically tormented. There are rumors that rodents had been found, having been brutally killed, and even some local cats, mostly strays, appeared to have been tortured. One eyewitness recalls seeing a stray cat that they were friendly with suddenly appear without a tail one day. Then on December 25th, Christmas Day, Yasuko mentioned to her father-in-law that a strange car had been seen parking in front of their house. This had happened on not just one occasion, but several, despite the fact that there were other parking lots nearby, which wouldn't have required the person parking to jump over a fence to get into the park. So this was seen as just being very disconcerting. Then, two days later, on December 27th, a man estimated to be in his 40s was seen walking around the Miyazawa family home by an eyewitness. This was a seemingly innocent thing, seeing as the park nearby ensures that people would be in the area for a variety of reasons, but in retrospect, looks kind of odd. Then, on December 29th, just days before the dawn of the new century, a man was spotted in the nearby Seijo Gakuenmei Station, which is just a few miles away from where the Miyazawa family lived. This man was wearing a skater type of outfit, which an eyewitness recalled as being odd due to the weather. They thought that this man, who was wearing a backpack, looked very underdressed for the winter climate. It was on this day, the 29th, that police believe a man matching this rough description purchased a sashimi knife from that same shopping area. It was the only one purchased at the supermarket on this day, so it was relatively easy to trace. A day later, on December 30th, a man matching the same description was spotted near Sengawa Station, roughly a mile away from where the Miyazawas lived. This individual was stated to be in the age range of 35 to 40 years old, and appeared to be getting closer and closer to the Miyazawa family home in Setagaya. Unbeknownst to them, Saturday, December 30th would be the last day for the entire Miyazawa family. They went about their business, preparing for the pending holiday. There was a festive cheer in the air, due to the upcoming new year which brought with it the fresh start of a new century. Sometime in the early evening, at around 6pm, some of the Miyazawa family members went shopping. We cannot be sure whether all four of the family members went, but an eyewitness recalled seeing all of them at a nearby shopping center at around 6. A neighbor, who drove by their house a short time later, recalled seeing the family car missing from their driveway at around 6.30pm. A short time later, the Miyazawas returned home and it was reported that at around 7 p.m. that night, Yasuko called next door to her mother. The families often used the phone to speak to one another, viewing themselves as neighbors. The conversation itself was very mundane, and seemed to be based around Yasuko asking her mother if she wanted to visit with her granddaughter. Just minutes later, 8-year-old Nina went next door to watch a recorded TV program, and stayed over there until roughly 9.30 p.m. or so. 
Up until this point in the evening, everything seemed to be going fine for the Miyazawa family. The last recorded activity we have of the Miyazawa family is an accessed email, which was read at around 10.38 p.m. We know that this was Mikio reading a work email, which was password protected, meaning that he was most likely personally responsible for opening it. This was the very last moment we know that at least one member of the Miyazawa family was alive. Their home, which was normally quiet and tranquil, was about to become a house of horrors. At around 10 o'clock that evening, a witness walking along the park path behind the Miyazawa house heard what appeared to be an argument taking place inside of it. This witness did not recall hearing any loud physical noises, or any particularly earth-shattering screams, but they said it just sounded like a couple was getting heated at one another. About an hour and a half later, a member of Yasko's family living next door would hear a loud banging sound from the other side of the duplex. They were not sure of the exact time, but they were able to estimate it later based on the schedule of television programming at the time. This was at around the same time that someone, another eyewitness, or perhaps a neighbor, recalled seeing a man hurrying along the walking path that traveled next to the family's house. These were the only three signs that something might have been amiss that night in Setagaya, but the terror that had been unleashed in the Miyazawa house would not be discovered for several hours. The next morning, New Year's Eve, Yasuko's mother living next door tried calling her daughter's family to make plans for later that afternoon. Surprisingly, her call wouldn't even go through, let alone ring next door. Unbeknownst to her, the phone lines in the Miyazawa family home had been cut, purposefully disconnected by someone hours beforehand. Failing to make contact with her family, Yasuko's mother traveled outside and walked over to the home containing her daughter, son-in-law, and two grandchildren. She rang the doorbell, receiving no answer, and according to the police report that she would file later, she used her set of keys to let herself in. The house itself was unusually silent, with no perceivable noise to make out. As Yasuko's mother entered the house, she would have undoubtedly known that something was wrong. After all, the family's car was still in the driveway, but there was nothing to hear and no one to receive her at the door or answer her phone calls. Within mere seconds, as she made her way into the Miyazawa family home, she was confronted by the body of her son-in-law, Mikio Miyazawa, at the bottom of their staircase. The 44-year-old had been stabbed multiple times, and was lying lifeless at the bottom of the staircase leading up to the second story. Yasuko's mother recalls going upstairs to the second story to try and see what had happened to the rest of her family. Immediately at the top of the stairs, she would find the bodies of her daughter, Yasuko, as well as her granddaughter, Nina, both of whom had been brutally stabbed dozens of times far surpassing the level of trauma that Mikio's body had received. Yasuko's mother recalls putting her hands on the bodies of her daughter and granddaughter, perhaps out of sorrow or maybe even hope, trying to see if there was a chance that either could still be alive. Yasuko, her daughter, whom she had raised and been close with for over 40 years, and Nina, her granddaughter, whom she had been watching a television program with just 12 or so hours beforehand, both of whom were now cold and lifeless, loved ones transformed into corpses by an unknown killer. In a nearby bedroom, Yasuko's mother would be confronted by her final tragedy. Six-year-old Ray, who had been battling through a speech impediment in an effort to please his parents, was still lying in bed. However, he had been strangled to death, leading investigators to think that he might have been the first member of the family killed. Needless to say, Yasuko's mother, this now traumatized grandmother, would contact the police, but the things that she had just seen could never be unseen, and nothing would bring back the family she had just lost. Tokyo police responded to the incident a short time later, and were just as horrified by the crime scene as Yasuko's mother had been. This was a case that would send shockwaves through the local area, and police at the time knew that it would terrify everyone. An entire family was butchered in the dead of night by an unknown assailant, making it perhaps the scariest situation one can imagine finding themselves in. At the scene, detectives began to look at the crime and piece together what had happened. Yasuko's mother, sister, and brother-in-law 
who had all been next door when the crime occurred, tried to recall anything odd or suspicious that might have happened the night prior. The only thing that really struck a bell for them was the loud thud that had occurred at around 11.30 that evening, the timing of which was corroborated by a TV schedule that placed the thud during a certain program. Police immediately suspected that the thud might have occurred when Mikio, the father, confronted this killer. Due to the wounds on his body, they believed that he might have scuffled with his family's attacker and the loud thud that Yasko's family had heard might have been him being thrown to the bottom of the stairs. The wounds that Mikio had sustained, multiple stab wounds, were primarily focused on his neck. Detectives would quickly place together that the stab wounds had been made by a sashimi knife, which was left behind in the family's kitchen. This was the knife that had been purchased just a day beforehand at a local supermarket, and had been brought to the scene by the killer. However, in the process of attacking Mikio, the knife had broken in some way. Unfortunately, the details of how exactly this knife had broken is something I do not know. But, based on the evidence found at the crime scene, police immediately theorized that the broken knife had been just one of two murder weapons. The other was a knife that the killer had likely found in Mikio and Yasko's own kitchen, which was used to kill Yasko and Nina upstairs. What police found unusual about Mikio's body was that he was still wearing his day clothes, business-friendly attire that he would wear out and about, perhaps to work. One report that I read online stated that he was still wearing just one shoe, which I find somewhat unusual. As for the bodies of Yasko and Nina, I need to briefly discuss the layout of the Miyazawa's family home. The layout of this house is hard to describe, so I will be posting pictures made with a 3D model on the podcast website. But anyhow, the house was built in a way that at the top of the stairs leading up to the second story, there was a ladder leading up to a third story loft. The third story loft had a bed and a television, so many have assumed that both Yasko and Nina were up there at the time of the murders, perhaps watching TV and lying down in bed. The bodies of both Yasko and Nina were found at the bottom of the ladder leading up to the third floor loft, each having been stabbed multiple times. Investigators immediately noted that the stab wounds were excessive, and they theorized that both female victims had been stabbed well beyond their point of death. This led to many theories about the killer being a woman-hater of sorts, or at least holding some kind of aggression towards women and girls. Sadly, this is not a sentiment altogether uncommon in these types of murders, but would come to be relevant to the later investigation. The fourth and final victim, six-year-old Ray, as I stated earlier, was found in bed, having been strangled. Police were originally stumped why the cause of death for Ray was different than the other three victims. But, as they began to piece together the clues from this crime scene, they figured that he was the first of the family to be killed. His final moments, while saved from the terror of his family being attacked before him, were still likely marred by a confusion that his six-year-old mind wouldn't have been able to comprehend. Early that afternoon, Roughly six hours after the bodies had been discovered in Setagaya, a young man was admitted to a medical center in Toboniko Station. Toboniko Station is a few hours north of Setagaya, the Tokyo district that the Miyazawa family lived in, and the two have many connecting trains that travel between them. The man, said to be in his 30s, was admitted without giving up his name or the reason for his injury. The injury itself was a hand wound, which was apparently severe enough to have exposed bone. Staff at the scene were surprised at how nonchalantly the man was treating the injury, and viewed him as being rather suspicious, due to him not giving up any information about himself. This man, as I stated, appeared to be well into his 30s, and was wearing a black down jacket with jeans. Despite not releasing any details about himself or how he had obtained the injury, the man was treated and then released by the medical staff, who had no idea what had just happened just hours beforehand a few hours south. Much to the surprise of investigators, the crime scene in Setagaya was absolutely covered in evidence. First and foremost, the police had uncovered the holy grail of most investigations by discovering the murder weapons early on. Both knives, the one purchased on the 29th and the other, one of the Miyazawa's kitchen knives, were easily found in the kitchen with blood still on them. 
Many police investigations stumble without a murder weapon, but in this case, the police had uncovered two within the early minutes of the investigation. Besides the knives, though, police would uncover that the Miyazawa family home was a treasure trove of evidence. They would find that the family's first aid kit had been opened, possibly by Yasuko and Nina, sometime during the assault itself. Some of the pieces of bandaging from the first aid kit were found with 8-year-old Nina's blood on them, and it is unknown whether the mother and daughter had been using it or if the killer had tried using the bandages to wipe off Nina's blood from himself. In the upstairs bathroom, disgustingly, police would find unflushed feces. This had apparently been left behind by the killer, either too ignorant of DNA testing or too arrogant in his own ability to get away with it. Upon investigation, analysts would discover remnants of a sesame spinach dish containing string beans, which had likely been eaten elsewhere. In the years since, Many internet web sleuths have called this somewhat of a boring dish, the kind that a mother would feed her son. This has evolved into a leading theory of a man that still lived at home with his mother, which I'll address in a little bit. All over the house, left behind haphazardly in bloodstains and in dirt, were the footprints of the assumed assailant. These shoe prints would become widely known as belonging to a specific type of slozenger shoe. Slozenger shoes at this point in time were available all over Japan, but the shoe print left behind was a very specific size not found in Japan. It was a Korean shoe size, and the shoe would have likely only been found for sale in South Korea, which jump-started many theories about the killer's ethnicity. Other than the bandages from the first aid kit used by 8-year-old Nina, there were also towels and women's sanitation towels which were found with unknown blood on them. To detectives, this was a startling find. It gave credence to the notion that Mikio had fought the attacker on the stairs, likely resulting in an injury to the assailant that required quick medical attention of his own. Police would have to send these blood samples away for testing, a process that is by no means an overnight solution. Until then, they would have to keep searching for evidence, which the killer had left behind almost intentionally. The most startling evidence uncovered in the investigation was a variety of clothing and items brought by the killer and then simply abandoned at the crime scene. It was as if the killer had left behind the clothing on purpose or at least paid no mind to leaving the items behind. The killer had likely worn an outfit to the crime scene, which was detailed as being clothing a skater would normally wear. These items included one gray crusher hat, one black airtech jacket, a purple and white long-sleeved shirt, which has been called a sweatshirt at times and a long-sleeved shirt at others, black Edwin gloves, a multicolored scarf without any tags, making it nearly unidentifiable, and a black handkerchief. The long-sleeved shirt was the most noteworthy of these items, due to the bloodstains found on it. This wasn't the type of clothing that anyone in the family would have worn, and wasn't the right size regardless. The shirt was white with purple sleeves, and it was only available in Marufuru shops, a retail chain that also sold the type of gloves and hat found at the crime scene. This shirt had only been made and sold about 130 times, according to an ABC report from December of 2019, but police have only been able to identify roughly 12 of its owners. The other 100 plus remain unidentified. The handkerchief was also noteworthy in its own way, as police discovered that the item had been ironed prior to its use. This was odd, simply because very few people would go through the effort of ironing a handkerchief. Plus, the idea of a young skater having one is in itself somewhat of an odd notion. So, internet theorists have attributed this handkerchief being ironed to another clue of the alleged killer living at home with a mother figure. Forensic analysts would discover trace elements of the male cologne Dracar Noir on the handkerchief, which is not a case-breaking piece of evidence, but still worth noting. All of the clothing items were found to have been washed in hard water, meaning that the water used to clean the clothing was full of minerals and vitamins not usually found in regular water. Japan itself has long used a soft water system, meaning that the water itself is just water with some sodium. This would be a point in favor of labeling the killer someone of Korean heritage, 
since Korea uses a hard water system, which matches the clothing. Other than the clothing, though, the killer left behind yet more evidence in the form of some personal items. The first and foremost of these items was a hip bag, like a mix between a messenger bag, a small backpack, and a fanny pack. It's hard to describe, so I recommend just googling hip bag for your own mental image. The hip bag itself was rather innocent looking, but did contain some pieces of evidence that would continue to guide the way investigators approached this case. The first piece of evidence was a piece of grip tape used for the surface of skateboards. The second were trace elements of Dracar Noir, the cologne found on the handkerchief. The last piece of evidence taken from this hip bag, most surprisingly, was sand. Prior to the making of this podcast, I had no idea how intricate and advanced the scientific testing of sand was. That may sound silly, but it's absolutely true. Apparently, forensic analysts can take a piece of sand and pinpoint almost exactly where that grain of sand came from, within a bubble of 50 to 100 miles or so. The sand found in that hip bag could be identified by the area it came from, which pointed to the southwestern United States. More specifically, the approximate area around Edwards Air Force Base the military installation about 100 miles north of Los Angeles. This startling piece of evidence, potentially linking the killer to a military installation thousands of miles away, has been perhaps the biggest wrench in the entire investigation. Many have viewed this as a sign that the killer was perhaps an airman stationed in Tokyo, or a type of contractor that did business in multiple countries. Some have even tried to link the clue of the ironed handkerchief as being a sign of military bearing as those in the military can verify that you have to iron your uniform a lot. Despite all of this evidence being present at the crime scene, police were not anywhere near finished piecing this case together. There would still be more revelations to break in the case, and there wasn't even the sign of a solid suspect on the horizon. Now, we're going to pause for just a moment to hear a word from today's sponsor. As you all know, true crime is one of my many passions, but every now and then, even I need the occasional break. Sometimes it's baseball, sometimes it's metal music, but other times it's just a nice little game to keep my mind engaged. Best Fiends, yes, Best Friends without the R, is a casual puzzle game that anyone can play and download for free, and is constantly being updated every month with new levels and events. It does not require internet to play, so I'm able to play it while taking the metro around here in DC, and it is a lot of fun. I just started playing Best Fiends, so I'm not very far in, but I'll be sure to update you all with my progress throughout the year, as I learn more about the quirky little characters you could play as, the bugs, and their evil villains, the slugs. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. And remember, that's Best Friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now, let's return to the show. Days began to turn into weeks, and then the weeks morphed into months. Police took the evidence they had to the public, appealing for anyone with knowledge of the clothing to come forward. They were able to track down several items of clothing to the people that had owned them, but almost every article left behind by the killer at the Miyazawa house was pretty common. Thousands of each had been sold in Japan in the year or so prior to the murders, so tracking down every owner of the clothing was a fruitless endeavor. In early April, about 100 days after the murders, police found something interesting. Originally brought in as evidence, they had discovered a small Buddhist statue less than a mile away from the Miyazawa home. The statue was in the image of Jizo, a Buddhist deity that protects children in the afterlife. In Eastern Asian incarnations of Buddhism, this deity is said to protect children in the afterlife who die before their parents, keeping them safe from demons as they ascend to the spirit world. 
Police originally brought this in as a piece of evidence, thinking that perhaps the killer had left it behind as a sign of guilt or remorse. But regardless of who placed it there, along a creek bed in the Setagaya province close to the family's home, it remains a tragic reminder of the crimes committed. As police continued to piece together the evidence from the crime scene and test the forensics against their burgeoning database, which back in 2000 and 2001 was still relatively new to the crime-fighting world, they had started to detail a series of events that led to the family being murdered. Police theorized that the second-story bathroom window, accessible to the back of the house and located just above a fence separating the house from the park, was most likely how the killer had entered the home. This would be a pretty physical feat and require at least some semblance of upper body strength for the killer to climb up into. After breaking into the house, they suspected that poor six-year-old Ray had been the first to be targeted by this killer, who entered his bedroom and strangled him while he was still sleeping. From there, the series of events splinters somewhat, with detectives being less than positive about the killer's next steps. They presumed that Mikio, downstairs working in the study on his computer, was distracted by some noise upstairs, and when he was walking up the stairs, he encountered the killer. There, a scuffle ensued, ending with Mikio hitting the bottom of the stairs, where he would be found hours later. If this series of events is to be believed, then Yasko and Nina were the next to be approached by the killer, who attacked them either upstairs in the third floor loft, or at the foot of the ladder leading up to it. Police theorize that the first aid kit had been utilized by Nina at some point, trying to bandage up some wounds of hers, so it is possible that the killer attacked them with his broken sashimi knife, quickly discovered that it was unusable, and he then retreated into the kitchen downstairs to get another. It was during this pause that the pair of Yasko and Nina potentially tried to get some medical attention for the eight-year-old, believing that the killer had run away for good, because why else wouldn't they have alerted the authorities immediately? If this theory is what happened, the killer had then returned upstairs to finish off the family, killing the mother and daughter at the bottom of the ladder leading up to the third floor loft. It is also possible that the killer had attacked eight-year-old Nina after killing her brother, and the girl might have been upstairs with her mother at the time. This was perhaps when Mikio heard the struggle going on upstairs, and rushed up there in an attempt to draw the killer away from his family, unaware that Ray had already been murdered. Their scuffle then led them to the stairs, where the killer managed to inflict the fatal wounds on Mikio, but also broke his murder weapon and suffered an injury of his own. Now close to the family's kitchen, the killer then went into it to fetch his new murder weapon, then went upstairs to finish off Yasko and Nina, who had been trying to heal Nina's injuries with bandages from the first aid kit. They were maybe heading up to the loft to try and hide from the killer, hoping that the ladder could be drawn up behind them. However, police would discover in the reenactment of the crime that the killer had not left the house after murdering the family of four. After brutally killing all four members of the Miyazawa family, he would stay in their house for hours. Evidence led police to the notion that the killer, instead of fleeing immediately after killing the Miyazawa family, had decided to stay in the house as an unwanted house guest. He had not even gone through the trouble of covering up the four family members' bodies, but decided to make himself comfortable for the evening. This individual had apparently napped on the family's living room sofa, which was one of the oddest developments in the story itself. Usually, suspects flee from the scene as soon as they can, as each minute there increases the odds of being discovered, but this killer had seemingly savored the intimacy of living in his victim's home for at least a night. The killer of the Miyazawa family had helped himself to food from the family's fridge, namely some ice cream from the freezer. Police would eventually discover four ice cream wrappers, also referred to as popsicle wrappers in some of the sources, with the supposed killer's fingerprints on them. These fingerprints matched up with other fingerprints left all over the house, which did not belong to any of the family members. This individual had also apparently used the family's computer, which was located in the downstairs study. They discovered that the computer had been accessed in the early morning of December 31st, specifically at 1.18 a.m., which police believed to be an hour or two after the family was likely murdered. The browser history shows that someone visited a website previously bookmarked by Mikio, 
belonging to the Shiki Theater Company. Mikio had a history of working with theater as it had been a passion of his, so one has to wonder if this was some kind of sick joke on behalf of the killer. Or perhaps the family had been murdered hours after many believed them to be. However, at 1.18 in the morning, we know that someone inside that house had visited the website and attempted to buy tickets for a show online. And police believed that the odds are heavily stacked in favor of the killer having done so. The killer had apparently also logged on hours later, at approximately 10.05 in the morning, to browse the websites of Mikio's company, Interbrand, and the school that Yasko taught at. Strangely, this individual only browsed websites the family had bookmarked themselves, perhaps trying to relish being in the intimacy of their home. After using the computer for a grand total of 10 minutes, this individual had then unplugged the computer from the wall. Throughout the night, the killer had gathered an assortment of the family's ID and credit cards, which were all found sorted in the family's living room, nearby the sofa that this individual had likely slept on. This was very odd, and many have theorized that this was an attempt by the killer or killers to try and guess the PIN codes needed to use the credit and debit cards. Once he left the scene, he was unlikely to try and keep guessing and risk exposure, so he left them all behind. Before leaving, this individual had also gathered an odd variety of the family's belongings and garbage, and put them in the bathtub for some unknown reason. These items were mainly garbage, such as ice cream wrappers or advertising leaflets that had been cut up, but also contained some of Mikio's work receipts and Yasko's school documents, along with some female sanitary items that contained the killer's blood. Many have wondered exactly why the killer would leave such an odd grouping of junk in the bathtub, but have figured that he maybe meant to do something with them and just forgot. Perhaps he had meant to let the items soak before being discovered, in an attempt to hide evidence, unaware that he had left boatloads of it throughout the house. After sleeping in the Miyazawa home for a few hours, police suspected that the killer had stolen some money from the family, approximately 150,000 yen, that's roughly the equivalent to a thousand dollars in American currency. However, the investigators were able to easily find more money in the family's study, where the killer had been eating ice cream and using the computer, leading them to think that this wasn't a simple robbery. After all, why would he leave behind more money that he could have easily found? Also, if this had been a robbery, the killer might have stolen some valuables, but it looked like the family's belongings were mostly left behind. The only item that was noticeably missing was an old jacket of Mikio's. But that was it. When Yasko's mother had entered the crime scene, she had recalled the front door being locked. This led police to think that the killer had left in another way, perhaps back through the second story bathroom window that he might have entered. But over the years, in comments made to the public, Yasko's mother has become less than certain that the door was locked when she arrived, and it has never become absolutely clear how the killer left the scene of this heinous crime. Over the years that have passed since this crime was committed, pieces of supposed evidence have been bandied about by internet web sleuths in an effort to find answers. But unfortunately, some of these clues have been proven to be entirely false, simply items that were falsely reported by investigators or misinterpreted altogether. The first of which would be postcards, which were reported as being missing from the family's home in the days after the murders. Early on, reports came out that the family's holiday greeting cards, sent by their friends and family in the weeks before the crime, had probably been stolen by the killer. I've seen this brought up a lot on internet message boards, but I hate to say that it is patently false. The missing postcards, quote-unquote, had simply been taken by an investigator who was following up with the family members and friends that had sent the cards to the Miyazawas. After all, where do you start any criminal investigation? Generally speaking, with the people closest to the family. So the postcards never went missing because they were always in the possession of law enforcement. The second piece of evidence that has since been discredited is the trace amounts of red dye found at the scene. For years, people had used this factoid to point to the killer being involved in the meth trade, perhaps even trying to link the Miyazawa family themselves to producing methamphetamine in their basement. Web sleuths have often linked the red dye to red phosphorus or red iodine, which are both commonly used in the manufacture of meth. 
The trace amounts of red dye turned out to be an ingredient commonly used in red highlighters, which could mean anything. Could be linked to Yasko's work as a teacher, or even Mikio's love of theater. I just wanted to get these two pieces of information out there, because almost every internet message board has thrown them out as being vital pieces of information, which in fact, they're both outdated information. Unfortunately, there are not many English language articles that have come out to correct these two, so most of the information regarding this case is close to two decades old. Over the years, no new answers have come to light. This unknown killer has almost become an urban legend, the type told by those who remembered an entire family being murdered by a midnight demon. We have our fair share of those in the Western Hemisphere as well, offenders whose antics have become larger than life in the retelling of their stories. But in 2006, forensic testing had progressed to the point where investigators could bring this demon back to life or at least take him from the mid-2000s zeitgeist of the Setagaya district and transform him back into a mortal man, made of nothing but flesh and bone. Using the blood left on towels and feminine products at the scene, DNA genome testing had been utilized to find out exactly what kind of person this killer was, and the results were pretty unexpected. Police discovered that the likely killer of the Miyazawa family was of a mixed race, and probably not a Japanese citizen. This individual's parents had belonged to two varying cultures, one of which was Eastern Asian, and the other was of Southern European descent. A police source later told the magazine Japan Today, quote, The killer was a male of Asian extraction. His DNA carried a marker from his father that occurs in one out of every 13 Japanese, one out of about 10 Chinese, and one in every five or so Koreans. Based on mitochondrial DNA, his mother had an ancestor originating from the southern Mediterranean area, probably around the Adriatic." Unquote. Just to unpack this statement a little bit, there is a chance that the perpetrator of this violent act is a Japanese citizen, but with the fingerprints not matching up with anything over the past 20 or so years, the odds are very slim. In the years after September 11th, Countries around the world have made it a priority to obtain fingerprints for anyone entering their borders, in an effort to catch criminals such as this. The odds of someone committing this act and then not showing up on anyone's radar, or at least committing a similar crime, remain very small. But the DNA doesn't lie. This unknown killer has a mother whose heritage lies in Southern Europe, perhaps Hispanic, and whose father is Eastern Asian. The only true inconsistency comes from trying to guess the overall heritage of the father, seeing how the genome found is prevalent in Koreans, but is also found in those of Chinese and Japanese descent. However, besides the potential DNA, we also know a few other facts about the killer. We know that he stands about 175 centimeters tall, roughly 5 foot 7, which was discovered by matching up the clothing he left behind at the crime scene. He also wore a specific type of Korean shoe size, which totals in at about 27.5 centimeters long, just under 11 inches. And based off the blood recovered at the scene, which did not match up with the family, he was of the blood type A. Of course, I say this knowing full well that we know these details about the killer, but he has somehow found a way to escape justice for almost two decades. There have been a few other strong theories to crop up over the years. I addressed one of them briefly earlier in the episode, but it regards the killer being a member of the military in some fashion. Evidence found in the hip bag left behind by the killer point to an area in the US Southwest, just north of Los Angeles, which leads us to Edwards Air Force Base. There has been a decent US military presence in Japan for decades now, and it's quite easy to make the assumption that someone who had gone through training at Edwards Air Force Base could then be stationed somewhere in Japan, perhaps even Yokoto Air Base, located just 40 minutes west of the Setagaya district. However, it is also worth articulating a counterpoint, that the evidence found in the hip bag, some grains of sand, could be an accidental misdirection. It is very possible that the bag itself had been obtained secondhand by the killer, as many skateboarding items were back then, perhaps purchased in a thrift shop or at a used skateboarding shop. 
or even on a site like eBay, which was very active at this time in late 2000. I have not been able to discover whether or not the Tokyo detectives handling the case have been able to double-check the fingerprints with military systems throughout the decades, but it stands to reason that there wasn't a lot of crossover in the years before 9-11. Another major theory regarding the killer is that he might have been a traveling vagrant who utilized the train system to make his escape. This is due to the Miyazawa home being located in Setagaya, a large district of Tokyo with easy access to several train systems, and there being a couple of which that were less than a few kilometers away. That information, paired with the unnamed man who was treated at a train station's medical center just a few hours away, has led many to believe that he might have been a wandering criminal who simply took advantage of the situation. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not throw out the most probable backstory of the killer, that he was someone the Miyazawas knew personally, or might have even been one of the skaters that Mikio had a beef with in the weeks before his untimely demise. This is very much a real possibility, and one I avoid because of how easy it is to throw out there, I guess. In December of 2015, noted Japanese true crime author Fumiya Ichihashi published a Japanese language book titled, in English, The Seitagaya Family Murder Case. In this book, he details his alleged suspect, a man identified as R, who was a former member of the South Korean military. Ichihashi utilizes evidence found at the crime scene, including dirt left behind that he apparently traced back to a Korean province which R lived in. Ichihashi also claims to have obtained the fingerprints of this suspect, which he alleges match up perfectly with those left behind at the crime scene. However, in the months and years since the publication of this book, the Korean government has refused to cooperate with any investigation into this Korean national, and Japanese officials seem less than certain about Ichihashi's theory. Only time will tell whether any of this leads to any answers, but the truth is that over a quarter million Japanese police officers and investigators have been involved with the investigation over the past 20 or so years. The hard work of these over 250,000 police officials, paired with a countless number of theories, has resulted in this suspect escaping justice for the better part of two decades. Close to 20 years later, the investigation to find this faceless killer continues, and the stories of Mikio, Yasuko, Niina, and Rei Miyazawa remain unresolved. Thank you for listening to this episode of Unresolved. I originally covered this story back in 2016, but I really wanted the chance to re-record everything and add in some new details that I've learned since. I hope you all enjoyed the new take on the story, and I hope that the story of the Setagaya murders continues to be told forever, or at least until justice is found for the family. I have been your host, Michael Whelan and I have been responsible for researching, writing, recording, and producing what you've been listening to. The music throughout this episode was composed by myself through Amper Music, with the exception of the song you're hearing now, the Unresolved theme song, which was written and composed by my friend, Ailsa Traves. To learn more about the podcast, just search for Unresolved online. You can find our website at unresolved.me, and we have accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also head to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod if you feel like supporting this show, and there you could get access to the cool perks that we offer. Because of the holidays and some traveling I've been doing, I've been a bit backed up on everything, but with the new year, I'm ready to start churning out those bonus episodes once again. So, patrons, prepare yourself. It's gonna be a busy year for all of us. Before I wrap up this episode, I would like to thank the wonderful producers of Unresolved, who support this show each month through Patreon. These producers are Maggie James, Ben Crocom, Roberta Jansen, Matthew Brock, Quill Carter, Peggy Ballarda, Laura Hannon, Evan White, Catherine Vatolaro, Damian Moore, Astrid Nyer, 
Amy Hampton, Emily McMeehan, Scott Meesey, Stephen Wilson, Sam Aubard, Scott Patzold, Marie Vankland, Laurie Rodriguez, Jessica Yount, Amy McGregor, Danny Williams, Sue Kirk, Sarah Moscaritolo, Thomas Ahern, Victoria Reed, Marion Welsh, Seth Morgan, Alyssa Lawton, Kelly Jo Hapgood, and Patrick. Sorry Patrick, you have a lot of additional Norwegian names that I'll likely butcher, so you'll probably forever just remain Patrick to me. Thank you for your support though, my man. Thank you all for your patience and support, and I cannot wait to return with a brand new Unresolved Story next weekend. Until then, stay safe, and I will talk to you later. Happy New Year, everyone.